And we're live. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the classrooms joining us and anyone who has live uh, late. Uh, my name is Jillian. I'm the founder of Trips for Kids. And here today at the Bimini Biological Field Station, also known as the Shark Lab, uh, on the island of Bimini in the Bahamas. And we're excited to be here starting off 2019 with a shark science hangout. So today we're going to talk a little bit about anatomy, some of the tools that scientists use to learn and study sharks, um, and also how scientists collect data and what they collect. And what does that all mean? We're talking about shark tagging and data. So we're going to go through and explain that. Uh, so you're actually going to get to see some shark science live today. Um, so I'm going to let you, uh, I'm going to let the team introduce themselves, and then we'll meet our classrooms that are on with us uh, and start talking shark science. Hi guys, my name is Chessie, I'm from London, England, um, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator at the Bimini Biological Field Station of the Bimini Shark Lab. And my job um, at the station is to be involved with the local community and um, help um, with the education and teaching about sharks here um, in the Bahamas and around the world, and also to invite people to come join us and be involved uh, with some of the shark science that we're going on at the lab. Um, so I'm really excited to be here with Vivian Sharks for Kids today. Um, and we hope you enjoy our, our presentation. Okay, I think Mr. Hyland, is that you? Uh, yes, that's us. We got on. Great. Awesome. All right. Well, welcome. We're going to do a, just an introduction in just a minute. If you guys want to go ahead and mute your microphone for now, um, and then we'll do class introductions in just a minute. All right. Uh, I'm Sarah. I'm from Texas, and I am one of the volunteers here at the Shark Lab. And I'm really excited to be able to be here with Jillian and hopefully teach you guys some new things about sharks. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And like Sarah, I'm one of the volunteers here at the lab and really excited to be here with you all today. Cool. All right. So uh, the lab is on the island of Bimini in the Bahamas, which is about 50 miles um, from Florida, so pretty close. And this lab was started in 1990 by John Gruber as a base for his lemon shark research. Uh, and so it's become very famous all around the world for the research that's done here. If you've watched documentaries or you've seen Shark Week, you've probably seen this building and certainly the sharks uh, here in Bimini on TV. And um, the lab now studies a lot of different species uh, that are found all around the island. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about how they actually study that. Um, but today we do have uh, a special guest. Um, before we introduce that, we are going to let our classrooms that are joining us, our groups, uh, say hello. So if we call you. Um, so first off, let's go ahead. We have Miss Holt's grade five. Do you guys want to say hello? Hello. 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 Hi. Hi. Awesome. All right. And then Mrs. Walzak's kindergarten class. Can you say hello? Hello. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. All right. And then we have uh, Mr. Highland's grade four. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and then uh, the Matusik Homeschool. We have a grade three and I think grade two students. Hi. 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 All right. Well, thank you guys so much um, for being our guests today. And then we also have another special guest. So behind the lab, the ocean's right out back. And if you think about a pasture, like a fence, with cows or sheep behind it, and that kind of keeps them in an area. The lab has a pen, but it's in the ocean, and they'll have juvenile nurse and lemon sharks, so the, the babies, and they come and they're there for about 30 days or less, and it's so people can visit the lab and come learn about sharks, see them. It's also so visiting scientists can see those sharks, as well as the volunteers, when they start here, they learn how to safely work with the sharks, handle them, um, to do some of the, the stuff that we're going to show you towards the end. Uh, so really important, they stay, they get fed, it's kind of like a spa break for the sharks, they don't have to hunt or worry about the food, and they get to kind of chill out for a little bit, and then they're released in the exact spot they were caught. So you're we have one today, and you guys will notice it looks a little bit different 
than maybe some of the other sharks that you've seen, all right? So I'm gonna just bring it over and show the camera. All right, so this is our special friend here today. This is a juvenile nurse shark, all right? And you can probably notice right away, it definitely does not look like what you probably think a shark is supposed to look like. Right, a pointy nose, big dorsal pin on the back. So first thing we're gonna start off, we're gonna talk a little bit about anatomy, what's different about this shark. Um, then we're gonna talk about some of the equipment that we actually use to study sharks, and why we're actually studying them, why we wanna learn these things. And then show you a little bit of what the data collection process looks like. It's called a workup. And it's collecting specific information from each individual shark to make sure we're learning about them. So we're going to go ahead and start off with anatomy, taking a closer look at this shark. All right, everyone. I'm Elizabeth again. And I'm going to be teaching you a little bit uh, about how we use anatomy to tell us about how a shark behaves, what it might eat, and where it might live. Because you can learn all of those things just by looking at the shark's body. All right. So first what I'm going to do is lift the shark up and I'm going to have you take a look at its face and point out some features of the face that kind of help us see uh, how the shark behaves and what it eats and such. So first thing you'll notice is it's got a really flat head, right? It's got wide set eyes that are white in color. And if I lift it, it's got these two protrusions up front, which are called barbels, and then its mouth right there. And so like you saw, the nurse shark, unlike other sharks, doesn't have super pointy teeth like you might think of when you think of a shark. So the nurse sharks actually crush their food up. So they like to suck in crustaceans, which are like conch or lobster or crabs, but crush them up with crushing plates, and that's how they'll eat their food. So unlike other sharks, which might eat fish and use those pointy teeth to catch fish, the nurse shark actually goes along the bottom of the ocean and searches for those crustaceans. And that's why they also use those barbels that I showed you. So those two protrusions out the front kind of like a catfish. So they'll actually use those to sift around the ocean floor and look for their food. With that, like I said before, they've got kind of really little eyes, right? And so they actually don't use their eyesight that much. Um, they use other sensory organs like those barbels and also ampullae and see. So I'll lift up the shark again so you can See those ampullae? They're kind of really little, almost like little freckles on the shark. You might see the front. And so they're going to use the barbels and those ampullae of Lorenzini to kind of look around for their food items. Um, and they oftentimes hunt at night, so they're nocturnal feeders. So they don't really need to use their eyesight to find those food items. Next, I'm going to show you kind of the fins of the shark that we've got here today. So, I'll pull them down here. These fins right here, those are the pectoral fins of the shark. So he's gonna use those to kind of scoot underneath the ledges and kind of move around. These fins right here are the pelvic fins. So those are gonna be used, actually, they're right next to the boeca or claspers if it's a male, which are like the barbels, two little protrusions. And that can help us sex the shark to decide if it's a female or a male shark. Next is the anal fin right back here. And then we've got the first dorsal fin, the second dorsal fin, and the caudal fin. So when you think of a shark, you might think of a caudal fin as kind of being forked and having an upper lobe and a lower lobe. But for the nurse shark, as you can see, it's kind of just got the single upper lobe, right? Which is kind of different than most sharks. So the nurse shark actually doesn't really swim very fast and doesn't swim a lot. It kind of hangs out under ledges and then at night will go around and try to find its food. But it's not a super fast swimmer like some of the other sharks, like a white shark or a mako shark. So these sharks don't actually need a lower lobe. It actually kind of gets in the way because they tend to sit on the bottom. So the lower lobe might get in the way of them sitting on the bottom. And as you can see right now, it just kind of hangs out sits on the bottom and does this thing called buccal pumping during the daytime a lot and at night. So if you can see the gills right here going in and out, that's what we call buccal pumping. So rather than other, some sharks like the hammerhead shark, they need to be constantly swimming in order to breathe. The nurse sharks can actually do this thing called buccal pumping where they suck in water and push it over their gills. So they don't need to be swimming around a lot. And that again helps them to sit on the bottom 
and hang out. Um, other than that, um, we'll move on to the skin. So, the, like I said, the dark sharks like to live underneath the ledges. So ledges are kind of rocky. There's a lot of things that they could get scratched on. So they need to have a really tough skin in order not to get scratched. So they actually have um, dermal denticles on their um, on their body, which are their skin pretty much. So dermal means skin in Latin, and then dento is like dent your teeth. So it actually translates as skin teeth. Um, so when you uh, feel them this way, they actually feel quite soft. And then if you go this way, they're quite rough, kind of like sandpaper almost. And so that helps the shark not only stay protected in the water when it's going underneath ledges and such, but it also creates um, a more streamlined swimming um, for the shark and keeps them able to move quickly through the water. Their shark doesn't do that so much, but other sharks do have that and do swim around quite a bit more. All right. All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the equipment um, that's used for uh, studying these animals. So uh, there's different methods for catching the sharks, uh, whether it's for putting them in the pens or uh, collecting this data or tagging them. But everything has been designed specifically for working with sharks and minimizing the stress. And you might think, wait a minute, how does a shark get stressed? But their body can react to being caught. So trying to make it as easy as possible on that animal, collect the data, let them go. Now, in order to kind of keep track of each individual, we tag them. You can think of the tag as sort of a name tag or um, a barcode for the shark. Like when you go to the store and items beep over the register, they have that little black and white print on the back. So there's sort of a barcode for each shark because um, the lab catches hundreds of sharks each year. Other scientists catch them. Um, can't remember all of them. So uh, it's a way to make sure each individual is identified and has a unique sort of um, ID tag. Now, there are small tags. Um, you guys may have heard of microchips that your cat has at home, your cat or dog. We actually can microchip sharks. And every shark that's caught here by the lab gets a microchip. And your dog or cat will have it between their shoulder blades. Um, the vet or the Humane Society would put them in, um, or even I think PetSmart, you might be able to do it. And this is what's in your cat or dog, right? You can see it's really, really, really tiny. Now, we put it just under the dorsal fin of the shark. It goes in, and it's that barcode. It lasts for about 15 to 20 years. So first thing when a shark is caught, there's a scanner, and you'll see we'll scan the shark when we do the workup. Um, that's turned on waved over that area of the shark, right? And if a number comes up, there's no number here because I don't have a tag anywhere here. But if I did, the number would come up. So if the shark has a tag, really interesting, can look at the data and see when was that shark caught or where was it caught. Okay? But if it doesn't, then they're going to put one in. Now it's going to have um, a specific ID and be part of the data that it's collecting, right? Another type of tag is called a dark tag or a Casey tag. So the paper comes off, but this little point goes just under the skin, stays on the shark, and you can see, and it goes just below the dorsal fin. You can see a number right there, so that's kind of instead of a, a name, there's a number. Right, and the information's recorded, tag comes off, the shark swims away. For these tags, you have to either catch the shark again or see it. Sometimes divers will see a tag like this, and they can take a photograph, um, and if they know who had done the tagging. They can get that number and, and uh, send that photo and say, hey, I saw the shark on this date, at this location. So it's really interesting to be able to see. We also hope that if a fisherman catches a shark and it has this, that they'll let it go because they know it's part of the study. Now, think of technology, what your phone can do now. Right? If you've ever watched a YouTube video on your phone, um, use a Skype. It's not just making phone calls. Right? You can get directions and maps. So technology is changing, and so is the ability for us to study sharks. So tags are having increased kind of different technology that is used to study different aspects of the shark's life. Um, and scientists ask different questions like, where does the shark go? Why does it go there? What habitats or what time of year? And these tags are really a tool to help us learn about that. So the other one is an acoustic tag. All right, and it can go, it can be mounted on the outside of the fin or inside the shark. Um, sharks have kind of an empty cavity space with no organs, right? 
on sort of what would be our abdomen. And you can make an incision, put this inside, stitch it up, shark swims on its way. Um, the shark would inflict in tonic immobility, so it's kind of a sleep-like state. It's a natural anesthesia for sharks. So you do this. And then inside, this tag is acoustic because it makes a noise. Each one has a unique ring tone. Okay? Now, the shark can't hear it. Right? It's not swimming around all day hearing its favorite song. Um, but receivers, which are kind of these underwater listening stations, are placed all around the Bahamas, throughout the Bahamas, up the East Coast, the United States, all over the world, depending on where people, researchers are working. And any time an animal, could be a turtle, could be a tuna, could be a shark, has one of these tags, swims within a certain distance, that receiver records the time of day, the water temperature, the date, and that animal. And it's been really interesting to see which animals um, spend time in a certain area, how much time during the day they're there, and who they're hanging out with. And believe it or not, some sharks have best buddies just like we do. And these tags are a way for us to learn that. So we can kind of learn about the secret life of these animals that we might not otherwise have access to just from diving with them or, or necessarily tagging them with different tags. Now the last tag has a special paint on it to keep it from getting algae growth because it's going to stay on the shark for a while. And there's a mini computer in there and batteries that charge this. It goes on the fin of the shark. It's called a spot tag. And anytime the shark's dorsal fin sticks up out of the water, there's a little sensor. When that feels air, it sends a signal. And that signal is a GPS location. So if you've used a phone to get directions or see where you are or map your bike ride, your run, um, it's the same kind of technology. It's kind of like strapping an iPhone to a shark. And what it does is it can help us see their movements. Uh, on, we use that on a really large shark here, particularly tiger sharks, to see where are they going. Because right? they don't spend their whole time each year in Bimini. Right? They spend part of the year here, so where do they go and why are they going there? Um, these tags help us understand that. And you might think, well, why? Why do we care where sharks go? Well, here in the Bahamas, it's a shark sanctuary, so they're actually protected here. It's illegal to catch and kill them. But in much of the world's oceans, that's not the case. So if we know that a species, uh, the great hammerheads that come here, are an endangered species. So they don't spend their whole year here. So where do they go? Because if they're all going to a certain area, maybe in Florida or further north, and we want to look at possibly getting protection put in that area, uh, because it's not just here that's important. So it helps us really understand that. So what you're going to see next is the other information that's collected when the shark is caught. So it's not just simply the tag. The tag can give us information. But there's also uh, some other data that's collected to learn about each individual reported with sharks all around the world. Hi, guys. Hey. So we're going to lead you on a scientific workup of this uh, nurse shark here. Sarah's going to lead it, and I'm going to assist her today. Cool. All right, so first what we're going to do is we're going to get our measuring trunk. So this is a pretty cool thing that we have, and we actually have a tape, measuring tape at the bottom of it so we can easily get the length measurements of the shark. So what we're going to do is we're just going to fill it up with some water and balance it on this top. Um, yeah, cool. So we have the zero here, and then we can measure. We'll put the shark in head first, and then we'll be able to do some measurements and set our work up. So the first thing that we usually do at the beginning is to see which shark it is. So like Jillian was saying, um, each shark has that pit tag. So what we're going to do is we're going to scan it and see if it has a number. Um, when it, if it does or if it doesn't, if it doesn't have a number, then what we'll do is we'll put in a pit tag and, and give it its own special number. And then we'll record everything in our data book um, so that we can look back on the research and compare the results. So what we'll first do is we'll turn the pit tag on. Maybe. And then we will scan it. Sweet. So. It has a number, and that's our shark. And now we can begin our workup. So first thing what we're going to do is we're going to take different length measurements. So we'll do our pre-caudal notch, which every shark has this little tiny notch right before their caudal fin. And um, that's where we'll take our first measurement, which is about 43.5 centimeters. 
And you know how most sharks have that fork that we were talking about? Um, nerve sharks don't have them, so we skip over that part, and we'll just go straight to total length. And we'll get it. It's about 60.5 centimeters. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to do girth measurements. So I'm going to show you one, and then we're going to let this shark swim around a little bit. So we wedge up underneath their pectoral fins in their little armpits, pinch it, pull it out, read it. It's about 21 centimeters. Um, the next measurements that we'll do will be just underneath their first dorsal fin around, and then that pre-collar notch again will take the girth measurements. Okay? So once we have all of the measurements taken, um, we'll start getting different other different kinds of samples. So the next one we'll do is we'll have this little tiny pair of scissors. Um, and kind of like how you trim your fingernails or toenails, we'll take a little tiny triangle, no bigger than the size of your pinky fingernail, a um, little clip out of their first dorsal fin. And that can help us determine a couple of things. One of them is DNA, which can kind of tell us what the shark is made up of and other things about the shark. Um, the next thing that we can get from that is an isotope analysis. So that can tell us long term what the shark has been eating. Another thing, there's two other ways that we can kind of check the diet of the shark. One of them is by taking a muscle sample um, just underneath that first dorsal fin, but on the other side of, like opposite side from where the pit side is. And we'll just take a little bit of their muscle, it doesn't hurt them. And that can kind of give us a shorter time frame of maybe a couple of months. And then the last one is we'll take some blood, kind of like you would at the doctor's office. And that can give us a very short term um, diet of the shark. And that's just taken right underneath that three paddle notch, just on their underside. And how we get that is we flip them into tonic, which is kind of like a chill resting state. Um, when they're belly side up, and we're holding the shark, and then we'll take the blood and then flip it back over, and the shark will swim away. And um, so for our juvenile sharks, we'll also weigh them. Um, but then for our bigger sharks, we don't, we can't really weigh them because we don't have um, a big enough <laughs> boat or tool to do that. Um, but we also will give the bigger sharks different tags, um, such as the PC tag. So, perfect. So that's how we do um, a scientific work off of our shark. Obviously, this is a very small shark, um, so it's pretty easy to do it in a tub. You can't get a huge tiger shark in a tub like this. So what we actually do is when we catch the big sharks, is we work them up alongside the boat. Um, so what happens is we let um, the boat swing so it's facing the current, so we get nice fresh current um, coming alongside the boat. Um, and then the shark is secured alongside, and we do all the same measurements, the exact same ones we've done here just over the side um, of the boat. Um, so it's pretty much the same basis, it doesn't matter if it's a small shark or it's a bigger one, um, it just, uh, it's a more efficient method to do it over the side of the boat and it also protects um, the shark. Our number one priority is always the well-being of the shark and, and of the people on that boat. And so we go out um, to catch these big sharks and we make sure that um, everyone has a job before we go. So we do a lot of practice before and we go out and catch these big sharks. So everyone knows what job needs to get done so we can make sure that that shark gets worked up as quickly as, poss um, as, quickly as possible um, and released nice and safely. And the workups never normally take more than 15 minutes. So you can imagine how quickly you can get all of those measurements um, and release that shark. Yes. All right, guys. So what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of rotate through and um, let everyone ask questions. So if you have, we'll do three questions per group. Um, so we'll go ahead and let's get started with uh, Miss Holt's class. If you have some questions for us. All right. So our first question is going to come from Kaden. Can you come over here, Kaden, so they can see you? So this is Kaden. Hi. Uh, what tools do marine biologists use? We use a lot of different tools. Um, like you saw when we were doing the workup, um, some of the tools we use are craft ourselves. So you do have to get kind of crafty when you're doing marine biology. 
Um, there's a lot you can do with these big PVC pipes, like you saw with the feeding trough, um, which I'm dumping water on now. Um, so we do use a lot of PVC piping for um, different measuring tools, um, different and for cameras, uh, we do like video footage, so we'll use different kinds of cameras. Uh, we'll use measuring tapes. Um, we'll use scissors, scissors, scalpels, a lot of different things. Um, a lot of surgical tools actually are also used. Um, humans too, um, so they get used on sharks. They get used on. Uh, and yeah. I'd like to use that. Lots of technology and marine biology is constantly evolving. So we're coming out with. We had new, uh, new tracking equipment, and a lot of uh, the measurement skills also need to be analyzed. We rely um, massively on uh, um, a lot of different scientists around the world who can analyze the blood sample, the DNA sample. It's actually very, very technical, some of the, uh, the different tools and equipment we do and, uh, answer certain scientific questions. Great question. All right, another one. Um, why did you become a marine biologist? I know for me, I was pretty young. By the time I knew I wanted to see the ocean, I wanted to learn more. Um, so I wanted to learn more, and um, so did. Started reading lots of books, and, and, and then as I got older, I was able to classes to, to learn even more. And, Kind of focus my study on uh, marine science and, and animal behavior. Um, so yeah, it's kind of I was just really fascinated by these animals, and it was a way to learn more and work with them. Um, for me, very similar. I was always interested in um, uh, different in fish and in mammals um, from a young age. Um, but my mum really got me into scuba diving and swimming. So we ever go on holiday. And with your parents and you go out in the sea, it's really cool sometimes to look around and record what you see. Because some of the species are well, there's huge vast array of different um, species you can see out there. I'm just constantly discovering uh, new species of fish, shark, all the time. So it's a really exciting field to be involved with because there's so much we don't know and there's so much we can find out through studying. Yeah. Uh, I was always in the water and um, grew to really like sharks and um, wanted to help save the sharks because I learned about how a lot of them are endangered, threatened, and I want to be. Just a quick reminder that any grade five. No. <laughs> um, for me, I grew up nowhere near an ocean, so I actually um, became interested in marine biology through the zoo that was nearby. They offered camps that you could go and learn about marine biology and I actually went on a camp to Florida um, and got to go to a laboratory there and kind of look around and I became really interested by um, how much field work you can do being outside every day um, going around collecting data um, and that really interested me and then as I got to learn more about marine biology as a field um, I just continued to become more interested like they were saying, there's a lot we don't know about. There's a lot of animals that are pretty endangered that need protection. Um, and the ocean's really beautiful, so it's an easy thing to want to protect. It's very nice. Great question. Mm -hmm. You guys have one more? One more. We have two kids that are going to ask together. Okay. Put in the camera, Riley. <laughs> what other types of animals do you guys see oh. while studying sharks? Yeah. Um, we do a lot of fishing, so we do see it. A fish, a lot, a lot of like crustaceans that we were talking about earlier. So the Bahamas, they have a lot of conch, so we see a lot of conch around. Um, lobster, crab, um, we we'll see squirrel fish as well, especially with the nurse sharks. Squirrel fish always like to hang out and poof up a little bit. We also see some puffer fish, which those are really cool. I haven't seen one poof yet, but. They're, they're quite adorable. <laughs> and, and also lots of prey species that these sharks um, feed on. We look and um, make sure we're monitoring those populations. We work in collaboration with um, uh, other institutions that are researching stuff like turtles, stingrays, um, all of the, there are some amazing creatures out there in the ocean. It's very, very cool. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
guys come back along. Cool, great questions, thank you. And all right, so we're gonna go to uh, Miss Walzak's class. Hi, we have two questions. One is, I wonder why the nurse sharks are so big and where they come from. Where do nurse sharks come from and why are they so big? Sharks give birth three different ways. And one of the ways is live birth. Some little sharks have an umbilical cord which leaves a belly button like we have. One of the living sharks here, that's what we have. This little nurse shark was actually in an egg case inside of its mother and then it hatched out and was born alive. Other sharks just lay egg cases. So they lay them like a chicken would lay an egg. Um, but the mother shark doesn't sit on the nest or guard it or take care of it. Um, they're completely on their own. And no matter how a shark is born, their parents are not around taking care of them. Um, and nurse sharks aren't one of the larger sharks, um, probably eight to nine feet. So there are a lot of species that get bigger than that. Um, but that's just, you know, the approximate size that works for their feeding habitats, the, ha the habits, the habitats they're in. And there's quite a range. I mean, sharks can be the size of my hand all the way up to bigger than a school bus um, and every size and shape in between and they've kind of adapted to the specific habitats, the food they eat um, and their behavior whether they migrate or not. Great question. And we have one more question. Could you tell us how? How do sharks see through the ocean? How do they see through the water? Well, she wants to. Hi. Their eyes. So our eye works in air because we live up on land. The shark's eyes are designed to work better when there is water against it. Like ocean animals, their eyes may have the same parts. Like these guys have rods and cones and similar uh, retina like we do. But their eye is designed specifically for working in the ocean. So if it comes up out of the water, the eye is going to take a little bit to adjust. It's going to be a bit blurred in vision. Just like if you open your eyes in a swimming pool or the ocean without goggles, you can kind of see, but it's pretty blurry and it's kind of like stings your eye a bit. So these animals, um, like sharks, like other ocean animals, their eyes are designed to be in the water to work best. Great question. All right, thank you guys. So then we're going to go to Mr. Highland's class. Do you have some questions for us? Okay, this is Emma and Justin, and they talk right to the camera. Is there a cure for sharks getting sick, and does it, is one of the ingredients of the signs of the shark? Um, sharks do get sick. They do have disease, just like humans. Um, you may have heard like sharks don't get cancer. People say that. And, um, that's not true. We don't know if every species has that. You know, at least some can. Um, they can get infections, other um, illnesses. They can get problems with their kidneys and liver. Um, so a lot of the same body parts that we have, they can suffer different illnesses as well. Um, it's difficult if it's in an aquarium situation or a, a research facility that's housing animals. They have, may have some medications they can give to treat certain things. Um, but out in the wild, the shark is pretty much on its own. Um, if it gets cut or has internal damage, they feel really quickly and recover from, say, a bite or a scratch, something like that. Um, but as far as getting external medicine, it's just like, you know, wild animals on land, if they get sick, they don't, they can't take themselves to the vet to get help. So, but they definitely get diseases, um, they can get sick, obviously. Great question. You guys have another one? Yeah, who's next? Brianna, come on. All right, this is Brianna. How long have you wanted for you to be working with the sharks in the natural habitat? Oh, can you say that again, sorry? How nerve-wracking and scary was it for you to work with the sharks in their own habitat? Oh, scary or nerve-wracking. Um, I think all of us are, I mean, you guys, like, what do you think? What's I, I love being in the water with sharks. Yeah. So I do, too. <laughs> but it's not, I mean, the first time you do it, yeah, you don't know what it's going to be like. It's like a, the first day of school, or if you're going to try skydiving or playing a new sport, like, if you've never done it, yeah, it's a little nervous, but um, we all dive with sharks, we all swim with sharks, and it's really about respect. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, 
don't try to describe them and, you know, and do anything harmful to them. We respect them. We give them their space. And that allows us to all be in with them and get to see them. Like, learn a lot, observe them. I mean, it's one of my favorite things to do, I'm sure. I mean, you guys, uh, oh, yes. I would use the word amazing. I don't know, what would you guys use to describe seeing uh, sharks in the wild? I just say it's more inspiring. I mean, when we're in the woods for a good swim, and you look at how well adapted the shark is to swimming through the water, and it really, it's an amazing experience. Um, and just to uh, kind of appreciate how well adapted they are and what great predators uh, they are in the ocean. And they're definitely beautiful um, and beautiful to describe. I think it's magical. It's almost like like when you're watching a hammerhead swim by you, it's almost like you're seeing a unicorn. It's it's just this amazing, amazing animal. And it's just it's really cool. Yeah, and once you get used to being in the water, it's actually really calm. Um, you're diving with sharks because I, you know, they're not really interested in checking you out too much. They might walk by, but it's very calm. You just kind of sit and observe, and it's really nice. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, we have, yeah, we have one more. How many? How many sharks are at your preserve, and do they give birth near the surface? Well, um, about 25% of all sharks and rays are threatened with extinction. So not a lot of them are actually preserved. Uh, there are certain species that are listed on something called CITES, which is an international protection of trade. So that means if a part of the shark can't be traded from a certain species of fin or the jaws. Um, then there's local, like here in the Palmas, all shark species are protected because it's a sanctuary. But then if you go over to Florida, only certain species are protected and only certain here so it really depends on where you are which species are protected um, but there are listings like the great hammerheads here are an endangered um, sawfish which are actually a ray kind of a flat shark they're critically endangered which means you know do things now to help protect them to point to come um, so that's really kind of so unfortunately not a lot of them are protected question. All right, we're going to finish off with uh, the Matusik Homeschool Group, if you guys have a couple questions for us. Okay. Last one, I'll send it to her. Go ahead. How many sharks did you tag in 2018? Oh, in 2018. Well, overall, in our database, we've tagged over 7,000 sharks. I'm pretty sure we so we have a we have a, a juvenile um, census on, on kind of a we go out and tag all the juvenile lemon sharks every kind of May and we tag about two hundred sharks just kind of in the space of a month. So the amount of sharks we probably tag is more, probably about I'd say three hundred uh, sharks kind of on average every year. But overall, on our whole database in the whole thirty years we've been um, a shark lab, we've tagged over seven thousand different individuals of sharks. And that's not counting the sharks that we recapture. Because sometimes we'll catch a shark and then we'll catch it a couple of months later. That's 7,000 individual uh, uh, sharks we've had, shark had, which is a crazy number of sharks. Cool. Question. You guys have another one? Which shark do you tag the most often? Ooh, that's a good one. I think overall, probably the lemon shark. Um, like Chessie was talking about, we do that pit project where we go out and take all of the newborn lemon sharks in Bimini. Um, we tend to see lemon sharks a lot around the bay because they use the mangrove habitat here as a nursery habitat when they're little, and then they come back as adults and actually give birth here. Um, so I would, I would say lemon sharks probably are the most tagged shark here. Probably followed up by nurse sharks and tiger sharks are also, the lab catches and tags a lot of tiger sharks, and they have a specific project to study them now. So um, yeah, a lot of really cool stuff. You guys have one more? You one more? Yes, I have one more. <laughs> How hard is it to tag a shark? I wouldn't say it's hard. The thing about tagging the sharks is we go through a lot of training to be able to do this. Um, so when we first come as interns, we basically, that you're in class for pretty much a month. Mm -hmm. um, so we teach you how to safely handle, to safely work with these sharks because our first priority is always the health and the well-being of the sharks and also ourselves. Um, 
what I would say is difficult is sometimes there are a lot of species of shark around here and sometimes we're going after a certain individual. That can be a tricky um, uh, part when it comes to tagging sharks. But the farmers have some really great populations um, of sharks. So if we're going out to catch nurse sharks, we know exactly where to find them due to the habitat that they kind of live in. But really, uh, we have a lot of different methods to do that. So we might free dive to tag some sharks, we might uh, catch them and uh, tie them up to the side of the boat with something called scientific long lines. So it really depends on the certain species we're going out to catch. Good question there. Great. Well, all right. Well, we want to thank all of our classrooms um, for joining us today. And if you guys are interested in learning a little bit more about the lab, um, if you wanted to visit Bimini, come for a tour or volunteer when you get a little bit older, uh, you can check out www.biminisharklab.com. Um, and if you want some more activities or lesson plans uh, to, to learn a bit more about sharks, you can check out www.sharksforkids.com. But thank you so much. Um, we're really excited. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys.